All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight for this episode of Just One Thing for Health, Physicians on Call, part of the Hippocrates Docs Initiative uh, toward Better Health. Tonight, we have Dr. Feinsinger from Colorado, and his topic tonight is about exercise. Um, we hope you tuned into his video this week, and we are so glad you're here to have a live Q&A with him tonight. So, Dr. Feinsinger, tell us a little bit about yourself and about what, why you think that exercise is so important. Um, <clears throat> well, I was a family physician at uh, Glenwood Medical Associates in, in Glenwood Springs for 42 years and retired uh, four years ago. Um, but being a family physician, I've always been interested in prevention because we deliver babies, we take care of people in nursing homes and, and see everybody in between. And after a few years of practice, you start seeing middle-aged and older people in particular who um, have, have diseases that are totally preventable. So you realize that it makes sense to try to prevent some of those diseases and um, matter of fact, so many of the chronic diseases that we suffer from in this country and other countries on the Western diet um, are preventable and reversible uh, through proper diet, particularly plant-based nutrition and regular exercise. Right, so um, I know that you know the science behind it, but for those who are listening and aren't really aware, what is the, what is the true impact of exercise? We all know it's good for us, but how is it good for us? Well, for, first of all, um, I don't know if everybody knows what the blue zones are, but there are five areas in the world where people seem to live a long time and they seem to live good quality lives up until the end. And um, the blue zones are Okinawa, um, the Seventh-day Adventists in Los Angeles, who for religious reasons are at least vegetarians, if not vegans. Um, there's an area of Costa Rica. There's an island off the coast of, coast of Greece and an area in Sardinia. Now, those are the blue zones. Um, <clears throat> so there are certain common threads that all those five areas have. So one is that they're plant-based. Um, for the most part, they're plant-based. Uh, you know, over 95% plant-based. Um, and also, they move about frequently. Um, and so they don't do what we tend to do in this country, you know, go to the gym and just work out intensely for an hour. But they're, in their cultures, uh, moving about is important. So uh, they've actually done studies on these people, and they tend to move about every 20 minutes. Um, I mean, they go and walk to the store. They uh, some of them are, are shepherds, have, have uh, jobs like that. Um, they just tend to move about uh, frequently. So, so instead of t intense activity, it's uh, frequent low level activity. Um, but there are lots of studies that show that people age better, um, they live longer and age better if they exercise regularly. And I certainly saw that in my practice. Um, in my family practice, you know, I would see people that were sedentary, who were in their 60s that had trouble getting up on the exam table, and other people who were in their 90s uh, who were active all their lives who just hopped right up on the exam table. Um, a lot of aging is loss of strength, and certainly if you exercise, you're not going to lose strength as rapidly compared to people who don't. Um, exercise has been shown to help prevent many diseases uh, like um, obesity, high blood pressure, depression, high cholesterol, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, uh, dementia even, um, and many kinds of cancer as well. It, it makes sense. Um, so from what you're saying, it sounds like functional exercise, just being active in your home is as good or better than doing that one hour a day for someone who maybe 
is sitting at a desk all day and goes to the gym for an hour. The functional exercise of just living is actually better. Yes, and for example, you know, people, <clears throat> people my age um, are always talking about, you know, getting a house that uh, there's no stairs in the, in, in the house that they want to get. And so they think that's important when they age. But actually, the opposite is true. It's showing that people age better if there's stairs in the house. And that's, of course, if you don't fall down the stairs and break your hip. But I actually have a friend who, a family member whose mother, uh, it's my sister-in-law, whose mother is in her 80s, in her late 80s, and still walks the stairs in her home. Interesting that you use that as an example. Yeah. Yes. She still has the stairs in her own home at 80s. <clears throat> Eight or eighty-nine, and you know, there's there's nothing wrong with doing vigorous exercise, um, although there is such a thing as too much exercise, and we can talk about that if you want. But but um, so going to the gym is better than you know, and working out intensely for an hour is better than doing nothing. But it's also been shown that if you, for example, exercise hard in the morning for an hour and then you sit at a desk all day long that sort of undoes the uh, benefits of the exercise so it's, you know so no matter what it's important that we move about periodically so so if you have a desk job it's really important that you get up and move about every 30 minutes and or that you have a standing desk mm -hmm. I was just going to ask if you think those are a good idea, too. I know one of your favorite docs and one of my favorite docs, Dr. Michael Greger, walks, right. he says, 20 miles a day on the uh, exercise desk. So uh, that, is, that is really a good option, isn't it, for people who are stationary at the desk? Right. Yeah, so Dr. Greger is certainly one of my heroes in the field of, of nutrition and so forth. And he, he wrote a book called Eat to Live. And, and the second half of the book is about what we should be eating and doing every day. And he's got his daily dozen. And ten. so 10 of those daily dozen things are things we should be eating. Um, then the 11th is uh, the fluids we ought to be drinking. Then the 12th is exercise. And his book is very evidence-based. Uh, the last 132 pages of this 400-page book is all references, mm -hmm. but he presents evidence that ideally people should be doing moderate, moderate exercise for 90 minutes every day uh, or intense exercise for 40 minutes every day. So unfortunately, you know, with most people's busy schedules these days, you know, most people don't have time to do that unless they're retired like I am. But um, but I what I tell people is to exercise and you know intensely, well moderately intensely at least for at least 30 minutes a day is a minimum. Not hard enough so you could talk but not sing. So if you're exercising and can't even talk to your friend who's exercising with you, you need to back off a little bit. But if you can sing a song, you have to go faster, harder. Do, do you have certain exercises that you uh, prefer for certain age groups? Would you say that um, we should change things around as we age? Well, I mean, I think that people need to do some kind of exercise that they enjoy. And there are those people that say they just don't like to exercise. But I think it's just because they haven't done it much before and you know once they make it part of their life then they do enjoy it so some people like going to the gym that's fine it's much more convenient just to go out and, and walk briskly you know um, and I personally prefer to exercise outside you know I think it's much less boring my wife goes to spinning classes a couple of days a week and um, and she, she likes that, but to me, it's, it's boring to work out inside like that. Um, so I, I think it's just whatever people are willing to do and, and enjoy and are willing to make part of their life. 
rather than, than uh, you know, healthcare providers telling them what type of exercise they should be doing. Right, the best exercise to do is the one that you'll do, right? So what would you uh, recommend to someone who is physically compromised, maybe, if they're in a wheelchair or if they have some limitations of strength, maybe in their arms? Do you have things you would recommend in that case? Well, they need, they need to get some cardio in somehow. So if you're a quadriplegic, that's impossible. But if you're paraplegic, um, it's, it's very possible to do all sorts of things with just, just using your arms. I, I see, well, I was in a Nordic ski race, so my, my favorite sport myself in the wintertime is Nordic skiing. So like skate skiing or classic track skiing. And I was in a race one time in, in Europe and somebody who was on a little sled thing because he was a paraplegic, so he was only using his arms. And he passed me in this race, which was <laughs> made me feel really humble. <laughs> That's great. He, he was younger than I was, but still, that was pretty impressive. So they, they should do to their ability, whatever exercise they can do to, to yeah. keep their yeah. strength. Um, I, I think people should start with walking. You know, it's something they can just put on their walking shoes in their house and go out the front door. And there's, you know, most places in the world you, you can walk. And um, so walking briskly, like that means at a four mile an hour pace, um, is, a, is a great kind of exercise. And, and unless you slip on the ice or something, you're not going to get injured by walking. And, and so that, that's what I recommend for people who really haven't exercised before. And I tell them to, to start out, you know, just doing it for 10 minutes. And, and in a couple of weeks, you know, work up to the 30 minutes. Okay. What do you think about high intensity interval training? I know you mentioned just a minute ago, if someone were unable to even speak to the person they might be working out with, they maybe should go back a little bit on the degree of, um, exercise. But do you think that the high in intensity interval training is a good idea for those who are able to do that? Uh, well, it is a good idea. It's been showing, showing to help um, prevent and reverse insulin resistance if you do interval training. So, so interval training is sort of where you do something intensely for a, a minute or two and get your heart rate up and your you work up a sweat and you're breathing rapidly and, and then you rest for a couple of minutes and then do several of those over the period of 20 or 30 minutes or so. And that, certainly that's um, a good thing to do ideally twice a week. But, you know, if you really want to get into to exercise, but I think for the average person, you know, they, they shouldn't have to worry about about that sort of thing, you know. You just ought to get out there and move about and, uh, you know, as, as, such as walking briskly at least at 30, 30 minutes a day. That's the place to start. You know, and, and then if you really want to get into a sure interval of training a couple times a week is good. And, um, of course, if you're a runner and you, you run – up and down hills that's like interval training and you know if you're Nordic ski and you're going up and down hills that's basically inter interval training versus just skiing on the flat. Right so you agree too that the outdoors well at least I agree with you that uh, I'd much prefer to work out outside. There are probably benefits that come from the fresh air and the environment. You feel the same way? Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on what your environment is. If you live on a really busy street, you know, you're, you don't want to be breathing exhaust. And, or like, uh, even in this valley, I, you know, I live in a rural part of Colorado up in the mountains, and we had some forest fires nearby this last summer. And, and you know, it was pretty smoky around here for a while. And so the question is, is it safe to exercise when it's that smoky? And and it, it may not be the ideal thing to do, to exercise outside in that situation. Right. 
and thought about that. The environment might also be a bad thing to do, uh, to, to, to exercise in. Well, we have, a, we have a question coming in from the audience. Uh, what's your favorite food to eat uh, as a front end fuel for a workout? Um, you know, I, I really don't, <clears throat> don't uh, gear what I eat around my exercise except that. Uh, there's a saying from the Blue Zones that's, that goes like this, eat breakfast like a king and lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper. So point being that, you know, for optimal health, you should really eat a, a good and healthy breakfast. And I go out of my way to do that um, with steel cut oats and uh, flaxseed on the oats and cinnamon and edamame. So I get like my legumes in and, um, and a handful of nuts and so forth. So I'm, I'm set till lunch, you know, if I eat a breakfast like that, even though I exercise pretty intensely every, every other day, I exercise intensely and then have easier days and alternate days. Um, I, th I think it's important to not exercise for about two hours after you eat. Um, you know, you hear about the, these middle-aged uh, men who die shoveling snow right after dinner in the wintertime. I mean, most of those people are couch potatoes and they do, don't do anything and all of a sudden they're outside when it's really cold, which is a stress on your heart and, and shoveling snow, which can be pretty intense exercise. Um, they kill over a heart attack. So, so there are people who die during exercise, although you're much less apt to die if you exercise regularly. But um, those people who do die, like um, dur during exercise, are usually people who have eaten um, a fairly big meal within an hour or two of, of when they were exercising. Interesting. You might have touched on a second part of the question. This is from our listener, Rita. Uh, she asked, what is a good whole food plant-based sustaining breakfast prior to a 10 kilometer cross country ski? Not a race, just a vigorous pace. You might have addressed that when you mentioned what you eat, but could you, it, it, for, for Rita's sake, give her a good answer on what you would recommend for that kind of a breakfast? Um. Well, I mean, what, what I <clears throat> eat most every morning is what I just mentioned, the steel cut oats and uh, with a whole bunch of things on it, like nuts and seeds, the seeds being uh, ground flaxseed and edamame and, and cinnamon and so forth, raisins. I, I start out with a, this bowl of oatmeal and by the time I'm done fixing my my put put all the stuff on it. There's kind of a big mound on top of it. Uh, it's, so, so, so I mean that's a, that's my pre-race uh, meal. But again, I I make sure that I'm finished with that meal two hours before I'm going to be in a race or do something really vigorous. Do you think it's okay to also wait until you af after you exercise before you eat? I think you can eat right after you exercise. I don't think that's an issue. I mean, I think you need to cool down a little bit. You know, if you're exercising intensely, you need to spend, you know, 20 minutes just kind of walking around and stretching and so forth. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I think it's important to drink a recovery drink. Like if you exercise intensely for an hour. Um, so, you know, there are also sorts of recovery drinks out there, and Gatorade is the one that everybody hears about. But I, I don't recommend Gatorade uh, because it's got way too much salt and way too much sugar in it. And I think it's unfortunate that the grocery stores put Gatorade in the middle of the aisles, you know, and then people think that uh, they hear about athletes drinking Gatorade partly because of the marketing. And so they think it must be healthy. So I see. I used to see people bring these big uh, bottles of Gatorade into the office with them, you know, when they came for an appointment. And uh, most people should not be drinking Gatorade. And even if you're running a marathon, 
of course, important to hydrate with more than just water uh, at least every hour. Uh, so, and maybe more often if it's hot outside. Um, but I think they're much healthier recovery drinks. Uh, I mean, heat is one that comes to mind, and there's a bunch of them. But if you go to a good running store or biking store, they'll have some of those. Um, I'll tell you what I use for a recovery drink. Um, so if I go, go to Nordic ski for an hour, uh, you know, hard, then I figure I need a recovery drink. Uh, drink, and that that is to um, replenish the glycans, glycogen stores in your muscles. Uh, so if you've been exercising intensely for an hour, uh, you know you use up all the glycogen in your muscles, and that's why people get cramps. One one of the reasons, anyway. Um, and so it's important to drink something to prevent that from happening, or at least to get the glycogen back in your muscles. So what I do is I buy, buy this, um, I, we call it green juice. So if you go to most grocery stores, oftentimes it's in a cooler and, and there's a couple of companies that make this stuff. It's, it's, um, it's well, like Odwalla is one and the green machines is another one. And it comes in big plastic bottles. So I fill up a water bottle, just about a, maybe a quarter full with that. And then I fill the rest of the bottle up with just water, and that's my recovery drink. And I think that's the healthiest one that I'm I'm aware of. Good. Uh, how about coconut water? Do you like that as a recovery well, fluid? Co coconut water is fine. It's just yeah, it's basically water with electrolytes, so that's fine. Okay. All right. Other coconut products I think are not healthy because of the saturated fat in coconut. Right. So like the coconut itself or coconut milk, coconut oil, I think the coconut water is fine. Okay. Fruits or vegetables? <clears throat> um, both. Okay. <laughs> and um, those are things great. Um, so if you eat fruit and vegetables like greens, then you're going to get a lot of okay. Um, the people who are really into the ultra marathons and these very strenuous uh, mm -hmm. types of exercise, they're probably creating a lot of stress in their body. Do you think that's maybe not the best way to exercise? At least for the average person, that wouldn't be a good, good place to start, would it? Um. Well, th there is such a thing as too much exercise, yes. And uh, probably running marathons is, is too much exercise. And the reason I say that is there have been studies recently that show that there actually is some damage to your heart muscle from running a marathon. So your cardiac enzymes increase a little bit, and uh, you know there's other evidence they found that, uh, yeah, you know running a marathon is hard on your heart. Mm -hmm. Ultra marathons are ultra hard on your heart, really. I mean, I don't think human beings are evolved to be running ultra marathons. You know, I'm talking about 50, 100 mile races, that sort of thing. And and you know, I <clears throat> I live in a valley where there lots of out, people out there exercising and some of these people are clearly over exercising you know there there are a lot of uh, young trust fund people up in aspen 30 miles away and that's all they have to do every day is exercise so that's what they do uh right riding their mountain bikes and running and nordic skiing etc cetera, etc cetera. and and actually it's it's been shown that People who exercise that much have more coronary artery disease than people that don't, and they also have. You're also more apt to have cardiac arrhythmias, such as atrial fibrillation, if you do things like repeated marathons and ultra marathons. And there's a really good book about this called *The Haywire Heart*, uh, written by three elite athletes and one of them's 
happens to be an um, uh, electrophysiologist. So that's a cardiologist who specializes in the electrical conduction system of the heart. And um, so they, they recommend against um, things like Belter marathons. Um, so <clears throat> there's a, a famous uh, ultra mar marathoner named Scott Jurek, J-U-R-E-K, and he wrote a really good book called Eat and Run, and he spoke here in Carbondale, where I live, at, a, at the local running store a couple of years ago, and he gave a very good talk. And um, so I, after his talk, I asked him about this, you know, how about these ultra marathoners who tend to die young and so forth? And and, and this guy, Scott Jurek, <clears throat> became a, a plant became plant based when he was a teenager, and he, he what he found out at that time that led him to go plant based was that if you go plant based, you're getting the most nutrients per calorie, and that's really important if you're doing things like running ultra marathons. And so he th said that he th thinks the reason so many ultra marathoners die young is that they're, ju they're just putting calories in their mouth and not worrying about the quality of the food. So they're eating pizzas and stuff like that. I mean, actually during the race, you know, they have a support team and they give them all this junk food to eat and he thinks that's the problem. And he's thinking that he's thinking that's not going to happen to him because of the diet he's on. So time will tell. He's, about, he's in his early 40s right now. But. He's still young. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's very interesting. I didn't know about his book. I knew he wrote a book, but I hadn't read that yet. Uh, I knew about his story a little bit. He's an interesting yeah. character. Well, we have some more questions here uh, from Joanne. After I exercise, such as swim a mile or ski uh, 10 kilometers, I'm very hungry and I seem to want to eat immediately. Do you have any suggestions as to what to do to make her less hungry? Um. Well, yes. So, so be sure you eat a proper meal, you know, two hours before you actually do the exercise. And then right afterwards, drink that recovery drink that I mentioned. Because, because I can, I, I know what she's talking about. And, uh, you know, so after I exercise for an hour intensely, as soon as I drink that recovery drink, I'm fine. I'm good. I don't, I'm not starving anymore. And I can wait till uh, it's time to eat lunch or whatever. Okay. So uh, she comments too, that she hears that protein is what we should eat to make us feel less hungry. Um, we know that there are plenty of plant-based sources of protein, but do you have a comment on the necessity for protein before or after your workout? You know, that Dr. Esselstyn is famous in the plant-based field. Um, he's featured in Forks Over Knives. He wrote a book called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. He uh, gave a talk in Carbondale a couple of years ago, and he and his wife stayed at our house for two nights, which was a privilege for us. And he said, don't eat your meals with a calculator. <laughs> what you're talking about is not quite using a calculator, but you know, if you eat a plant-based diet, whole foods diet as well, you know, no refined foods and, and avoid salt, sugar and oil, you're gonna get all the protein you need. Um, and I think what is satiating to people actually is when they eat something fatty. You know, if you eat a fatty meal, um, which includes a, a meal with a lot of oil in it, it just kind of sits in your stomach because it's because fat slows down digestion. So I think it's more that than than a need for protein. Um, so would nuts be a good snack then? Uh, if if a heavier fat load would be more satiating, how about nuts? as a snack uh, before or, or during exercise to make you feel a little bit less hungry. Yeah, yeah so nuts would be a great snack because okay. you're getting some healthy fats, especially walnuts and almonds and pecans and even peanuts. 
which technically are not their legume, but nutritionally speaking, they're like nuts. Right, and they have a high fat content too, don't they? Right. I usually take walnuts with me on my long walks. Um, we take walnuts and goji berries and uh, bananas or apples, whatever. But uh, I think that um, I'm glad that Joanne asked that because I was wondering too, are the, are the walnuts a good or bad snack to have on Walnuts them? are good. So, so all, all nuts have good and bad fats and walnuts have the best ratio of good to the bad. Good. And second best would be uh, almonds and pecans and peanuts. Okay, super. So maybe Joanne can uh, add some nuts to her workout. That'd be great. Yeah, so I think if you make your own trail mix, you know, that's a good thing to, to do is you can make it very healthy, you know, by nuts and raisins and seeds and things like that. I think if you buy trail mix, it's going to have a lot of junk in it, probably. Right. Our most energy bars are probably not particularly healthy. Right. Okay. So in your video, you talked about uh, losing weight. And you say it's more important what we don't eat rather than exercising to lose weight. So would you like to elaborate at, on that idea just a little bit? Yeah. So <laughs> patients often come to me. And they say, I want to lose weight, so I'm going to start exercising. And I certainly don't discourage them from starting exercising. But I do point out to them that if for losing weight, it's what you don't eat. That's the most important thing. So, if, so it kind of drives me nuts a little bit that our local hospital in Glenwood Springs has a Starbucks, you know. And, and there aren't too many things at Starbucks that are really healthy. Uh, I'm not a coffee drinker, so I mean, a little coffee is probably okay, but, but I, I tell them that they go and eat the healthiest thing they can find there, which is probably a brand muffin, that they have to play tennis for an hour and 10 minutes to work that off. So that's just an example of how what you don't eat is, is uh, more important than exercise for losing weight. So <laughs> if, you, if you go on a plant-based whole foods diet, um, you know, everybody's going to lose weight and get, and most people get down to their ideal body weight by eating that really healthy diet. Um, and for ma maintenance of weight loss though, of course, if you stick to that diet, you're probably fine, but ac regular exercise every day helps maintain weight loss, right. let alone all the health benefits that we already talked about. Right. And I, I think maybe you would agree as a physician that even though people can lose a substantial amount of weight by exercising, if they really go after it, as soon as they slow down, they're going to gain that back. If they haven't changed the lifestyle around, you know, what's causing them to gain weight, then they'll just gain it back. Is that what you've found too? Let's say yeah. someone yeah. exercise yeah. like crazy and loses 50 pounds. Because most of these people are going to stay with a you know really intense, intensely vigorous exercise program forever. Right. And if they eat the same old diet, sure, they're going to gain their weight back. So and I've got a relative who who is in her early forties, and she has always exercised a lot, but she also ate a lot and now that she's in her early 40s and her metabolism's changing a little bit she's definitely gaining some weight and um you know so that's uh, a case in point that that eating contributes to weight gain no matter whether you exercise or not so as we age talking about metabolism as we age our metabolism slows down we should really be eating less is that what do you think? I think the most important thing is, is to stay away from calorie dense foods. Mm -hmm. so, so you want to be like uh, Scott Jurek and eat things with lots of nutrients per calorie instead of lots of calories per nutrient, which is what most Americans eat. There's too many calories per nutrient. 
So what are, your, what are some of your favorite things to eat? I know you mentioned your breakfast, which sounded really good. Uh, what are some of your favorite things to eat for lunch and dinner? I mean, I know you're, um, you're whole food plant-based. Right. Uh, no oil. Right. Well, so I, for, for lunch, I, uh, every day I try to have a, real, a big salad for either lunch or dinner, but usually for lunch. So I make, a, make my own salad. Of course, you know, it takes a while to make a good salad, but I'm retired, so I have time to do that. Uh, although, you know, you can buy already chopped up vegetables now at the grocery store. So that, if that's part of it's gotten easier. But, but I try to have a salad with, um, I try to follow the principle of eat the rainbow, you know, so if you eat foods, that are intensely colored, you know, you get a lot more antioxidants and, and cancer fighting properties and so forth. And that's also true of foods with intense uh, taste like herbs and spices. So I try to kind of uh, keep that and eat the rainbow thing in my mind when I'm making my salad. And then I put vinegar on it, balsamic vinegar or apple cider vinegar which uh, Dr. Greger's just done some things on his website about how vinegar is really good for people. Ideally, like two tablespoons of it a day. Um, and uh, no, I don't put oil on my salad, but I put seeds on it, like un unsalted pump pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds. And uh, those give me some good fats, and then they also help absorb the fat-soluble vitamins from the greens. Uh, sometimes I'll put a few nuts on the salad, um, and uh, so that, that's what I usually have for lunch, and maybe a little bit of a leftover from dinner the night before, depending on what we had. Sometimes some healthy crackers with hummus, um, Rip Esselstyn's hummus, uh, he, he works for Whole Foods, so this is Dr. Esselstyn's son. It was a world-class triathlete at one time and then became a fireman. And now he's got this line of products at Whole Foods called Plant Strong, uh, Engine 2 Plant Strong. So Engine 2 comes from the firehouse. And, and uh, so he's, for example, got hummus with no added oil. Uh, you can also make your own hummus, which my wife tells me is easy to do. Uh, and don't add oil to it. So that, that's the kind of thing I have for lunch. And then for dinner, you know, I'm lucky because my wife's an excellent cook and, uh, and so she makes very healthy yet tasty food for dinner. Great, great. Well, Lynn has a question for you. Uh, she says, um, which, number one, she's excited to hear about your first book that's coming out in February. So can you tell us about your book? Um, yeah, so I, so since I retired four years ago, I've been writing a weekly health column for the local newspaper. And, um, and uh, so I just took um, 98 of the columns that I think thought, you know, people would like the best and made a book out of them. Uh, I thought I thought it, this would be really easy because uh, I'd already done all the work of writing these columns, but <laughs> it was not as easy as I thought. It's taken quite a bit of time and effort. Um, you know, I had to do a lot of editing and so forth, but it should be coming out in the next within the next two weeks. That's wonderful! Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and then my wife did. A, one section of the book at the end about helping people um, transition to plant-based nutrition, you know, just, you know, things you should have in your pantry and that sort of thing. Uh, she uh, was a nurse practitioner for, for many years. And uh, as I say, she's, she's an excellent cook. So, so I think that section of the book that people are going to like as well. That's wonderful. Will it be available in um, all the bookstores, or would you, would we find that online through Amazon? 
Uh, it'll be available on Amazon for sure. And okay. Hopefully some bookstores will want to carry it as well. Wonderful. Well, I wish you well with that, Dr. Feinsinger. So we're Thank seeing you. a um, an image of the book cover. And in the center, it looks like there are two people skiing. You want to tell us a little bit about that, Dr. Feinsinger? <laughs> This is actually when we were in Europe a few years ago. I've done, I've done 11 of these <clears throat> world loppets, they're called. Uh, and they're, um, they're, they're about 15 countries in the world that have them, one world loppet. A loppet is a Scandinavian word that means long run. And uh, so we were in, I think, this was taken in Austria. And yeah, we we didn't. What we wanted was a photo showing people leading an active life, you know, and we didn't particularly want our faces in view, but uh, that's me and a friend, my wife in the back. Nice. Wonderful. Very nice. And again, congratulations. We look forward to helping you spread the word that your book is out. Thank you. And another question has come up. Can you explain a little bit about the science behind how exercise helps with immune function? Um, well, that's an interesting question because too much exercise actually lowers your immunity. So, for example, um, you hear about these Olympic athletes, you know, they're training for the Olympics and and some of them are maybe overtraining a little bit and then right before the Olymp Olympics they get sick because their immune system is, is down. But for the most part, you know, I, but these are people obviously who are elite athletes and training much more intensely than most of us do. But for, for most of us, uh, just doing regular exercises um, increases your immunity and makes your immune system stronger. So there's a threshold that we should be aware of between yeah. um, what's helpful and a normal range of exercise and what's the elite um, exercise. That right. Might yeah, and I've noticed this. I mean, people will run a marathon and then they come down with a cold. And I've noticed after some of these long um, Nordic ski races that I did, you know, some of them are, uh, well, they're anywhere between basically 50 and, and 75 kilometers. So um, after some of those, I came down with a cold or something because that was I kind of pushed the limits or my limits anyway. Right. So if someone when I was training for the half marathon and maybe even now, I find myself doing a couple of long walks because I'm not a runner uh, a couple of times a week as opposed to exercising every day for like you said, what might be a good, you know, 90 minutes or 40 minutes, depending on the intensity. Right. That just as good if I'm walking ten mi eight or ten miles, two times, three times a week, versus getting in my exercise every single day. It's probably best to do it every single day, but <clears throat> I mean, I I haven't been retired that long. I remember what it was like to work, um, so when I was working full time, I, I had Wednesday afternoons off, so I had always exercise for an hour or so on Wednesday afternoons and then Saturday and Sunday. But I didn't the other days, but you know, I just felt I didn't didn't have time to, to do it the other days. But but since I then I semi retired for 10 years before I totally retired and then I was able to exercise every day. But but <clears throat> you know when you get into your 70s um, um, and now that I'm in my late 70s, you know, you, you can't just hammer it every day. Uh, I found that out the hard way. I mean, you just, you know, if you try to hammer it every day, you just don't really fully recovery, recover. So I think when you get in past 65 or so, you know, you, you should alternate hard days with easy days. So a hard day for me would be to go up to the local Nordic ski area and you know, exercise vigorously for an hour or ride my mountain bike in the summertime, you know, uphill or up and down hills uh, for an hour or hour and a half. 
Uh, an easy day would be, I just go out on the golf course with my backcountry skis and my dog and, and just uh, kind of uh, go around there for a couple of times, which takes an hour. Okay, good advice. Well, what, uh, what would you tell us about the science behind keeping our bones strong? We generally think that exercise helps increase muscle strength, but how does it also affect our bones? Well, weight-bearing exercise has been shown to help keep our bones strong. So weight-bearing exercise is like walking or jogging, you know, versus swimming or riding a bike, for example. Um, but what we eat, you know, affects that even more. And so it, it's kind of ironic and, and kind of counterintuitive uh, but people who are on a animal-based diet actually have more osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is really, for the most part, a disease of Western societies and what we eat. Mm -hmm. So the best way to get calcium is not in milk or cheese or other dairy products, but by eating legumes and green leafy vegetables. Um, and Dr. Greger, so on, uh, you know, he, in addition to the book I mentioned, he's got this wonderful website um, called nutritionfacts.org. And so you can, you can search things on the website, like osteoporosis, and he's done several short videos and blogs about, about this. Um, calcium supplements are also not the way to go because um, as with most supplements, including vitamin pills, you know, we didn't evolve to get hit with this huge dose of calcium or vitamin E or whatever it is, so that our bodies really don't know, know how to handle that. And people who take calcium supplements have more calcium in their arteries, which contributes to heart of the arteries and heart attacks and strokes. Um, so it's better not to take calcium supplements, and it's the best way to get calcium is through. Uh, green leafy vegetables and legumes. Um, but, you know, moving about is also important, um, and especially weight-bearing exercise. Okay. Wonderful advice. Um, so, uh, when, when someone is new to exercising, you might just recommend walking as they, as they start out. Do you, do you recommend a certain routine for uh, weight-bearing exercise? Would you have them do a certain number of days or a certain number of minutes per week? No, because I, I think it's important to keep this simple. If you make it too complicated, you know, people are going to throw up their hands and not do anything. So I don't get, I don't get into that part of it. Uh, or initially at least. Okay. Well, Lynn, do we have any more questions tonight? Oh, we do have one more. Uh, does, I, I'm sorry, I missed this one. This one came in too. Does exercise improve sleep and sleep patterns? Uh, yes, for sure. Uh, for for sleep, it's best to exercise in the morning, and and you don't want to exercise within a couple of hours of when you go to bed, because that sort of wires people. But if you exercise in the morning, or earlier in the day anyway, it definitely in, improves people's sleep and improves their mood as well. Um, you know. Regular aerobic exercise works just as well, if not better, than most antidepressants for mild to moderate depression. Um, and one of the reasons is probably that you sleep better, you know, and people who are depressed often have sleep problems. Mm -hmm. so one, one other thing I probably should mention about exercise is that if you're if you have a lot of risk factors for heart disease, so say you're a middle-aged man and you 
have a belly on you, so, which means you've got insulin resistance slash prediabetes, and probably have some heart disease and so forth. And you go out and start being really competitive about exercising or or do th things that you shouldn't be, that you aren't really ready to do, um, yeah, that can be dangerous. So if, so if you have risk factors for heart disease, like, like prediabetes, or you have high blood pressure, you have high cholesterol, you have a family history of heart attacks and strokes at an early age, that sort of thing, um, you, you definitely ought to talk to your doctor about maybe having a stress test done before you go out and exercise hard. If you've been exercising all your life, you know, that's not necessary. But if you've been a couch potato most of your life, it's, it's not good to suddenly go out and just push it too hard. Not good for your heart, not good for your musculoskeletal system. You know, you're, you're kind of an injury waiting to happen if you do that. My mother has COPD and she has a hard time walking uh, for any long distance. She, she gets really winded and it's just very hard for her. And I, I see her as she progresses getting less and less able to move very well. What could she do to maybe regain some of her movement, even though the COPD causes her to get so tired fast? Well, the problem with COPD, so for people that don't know, that's the same as emphysema, where you lose um, a lot of little air sacs in your lungs. Uh, it's often caused by smoking. Um, and so most people with emphysema are going to have a low oxygen level, and particularly if they exercise. And of course, we live at altitude. We live at over 6,000 feet here, so it's especially problematic at, at our altitude. Um, so they, you know, you don't want to drop your oxygen below 90, ideally. Um, you know, our oxygen levels should be over 90, 100% uh, of the time. And so it's not safe to drop it much below that. So, so uh, you know, people with COPD uh, usually have an oximeter, which is a little gadget that you put on your finger and it measures the oxygen level in your blood. So they should use one of those when they're exercising and just try to find that window where their oxygen doesn't drop and yet they'll be able to, to move about a little bit. Thank you, I'll let her know. Well, Lynn, any more questions on your side? Oh, one more, here's one now. What about our kids? What do you recommend to parents about getting their kids to be more active? Uh, limit their screen time. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's the problem these days is these kids spend way too much time on their iPhones and, and computers and so forth. And, uh, and it doesn't bode well for their future health. Um, you know, kids used to go out and play, you know, they didn't have other things to distract them. But uh, so, you know, I, I, I have three kids and uh, they're all grown, but I have grandkids and I don't know. I'm glad I'm not a parent in this day and age. I think it's tough to get kids off away from their cell phones. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think that just like with eating fruits and vegetables and whole grains and so forth, um, you know, the parents have to set a good example. So if the parents aren't very sedentary, then the kids are more likely to be sedentary. If the parents, uh, you know, are eating pizza and donuts and so forth all the time, the kids are less apt to be eating a healthy diet. Exactly. But I think it's very important to get kids active. Um, you know, a good example of this is there's the most common kind of diabetes is type 2 diabetes. And that's usually people, people get it when they're older and because they gain weight, especially heaviness around the middle. And um, we used to call that adult onset diabetes. 
We don't call it that anymore because a lot of kids have, di have type 2 diabetes now. Um, I, you know, the, the doctors in the medical group that I practiced in um, have done sports physicals in the spring for free uh, for the kids for decades. And I, I remember when I first started in the early 70s, um, you know, these kids that come in for their sports physical, they basically just listen to their heart and lungs and do a, do a simple exam. But, um, you know, we never saw overweight kids. But the last few years, most of the kids are overweight. They have little belt bellies on them. And sometimes I'll, I'll mention to them that before they start football practice, you know, maybe they should try to lose a little weight and exercise more. But they don't get it because all their friends are like that. So they think it's normal to be like that. And this is not just a problem in the United States. It's a problem worldwide because if you travel to Europe or other places, uh, even Japan, you know, kids are overweight now and they didn't used to be. And a lot of it is that we're exporting the SAD, Standard American Diet, to the rest of the world. So we used to export tobacco to the rest of the world. We still do that, but now we're also exporting our lifestyle, our sedentary lifestyle with a diet that's high in refined foods and fat and so forth. Right. Wow. Wow. I, I just, I keep saying wow, because one of the things that comes to mind for me is, especially where the kids are concerned, milk, cereal, and the sugary cereals, but the milk. And, right. um, do you have something that, or are, are, are there any foods that would be good substitutes to wean your kids off of milk and off of the uh, sugary things that have enticed them to eat more and more of? Well, I mean, I lay the blame at the feet of the food industry because they get people hooked on salt, sugar, and fat. And you know, when you eat things with salt, sugar, and fat, the dopamine in your brain goes up, just like it does with narcotics, with alcohol, and things like that. And so I think the food companies are just shameless about this. They, they I mean, why do they put salt in um, unsweetened almond milk? I mean, there's only one reason you do that, is to get people kind of hooked on it. And so, but you just have to, as a parent, you just have to do the best you can. So, so it's better not to drink cow's milk for sure, unless you're a baby cow. Um, that's what it's made for. But if you're a young human or an adult human, it's better to stay away from cow's milk and other dairy products. So, you know, for, for the milk part of it, they should be using like unsweetened soy milk or almond milk. Um, and then I would say, uh, don't buy anything, especially cereal, that's in a box. Because it's always going to have, I don't care if it sounds really healthy, it's going to have some salt in it, it's going to have some sugar in it, it's going to have some oil in it, you know, almost all the time. And, and then the food companies hook people in like with fruit loops. So just because of the word fruit, the parents think, oh, it's got to be healthy. But it's, of course it's not. I mean, it's just junk food. So the best thing to do for breakfast is going to be oatmeal or some kind of hot cereal that you make, and um, and uh, you know, and then you can't go wrong with that. Good to know. Good to know. Thank you, Dr. Feinsinger. I'm looking at the time, and this has been a most robust conversation. Loved all the questions. Thank you, Lisa. Fabulous job as always. And thank you, Dr. Gold, uh, Feinstinger, because your information, I think, was uh, very um, broad in that it captured what so many across the board need to hear about the food industry, about our kids, about our diets, and, and especially as it relates to exercising. So thank you for that. Love the book. 
can't wait until it comes out. You know, we're just going to be one of your biggest fans, part of the fanfare. And uh, we're really excited to participate in that with you. And to our audience, thank you for joining us this evening. It has really been our honor and pleasure to have brought you Dr. Feinsinger and all of this amazing information. Thank you to our guests in our live audience. And to those of you who are going to be watching the replay, do hit the comment box at the bottom of the video and let us know whether this was helpful information for you, if you want more information on, if there are questions that you have that you'd like answers to, let us know. We are here for you and we want you to have the information from these dedicated doctors who are looking at helping to heal not just us and their patients, but the world by disseminating this information. So I'd love to invite you to join us next week when our guest is going to actually be talking about how to cook without oil. Something that a lot of us really can't even fathom because we've grown up with it. We have brought it to our own families and our own lives. And, you know, that when you talk about a challenge to eliminate oil, um, that coupled with the, the opportunity to hear some ways to uh, cook without oil, that's going to be exciting. So do join us next week with Dr. Kathy McCree, who's going to be talking about all of that. Watch out for the next challenge video. And if you didn't get a chance to watch Dr. Feinsinger's challenge video, you'll find that link at the bottom of this video do watch it and connect the dots and bring this healthy lifestyle to your family, to your friends. Be the example that your friends want to see. So thank you once again for joining us tonight. I'm Velen Hawkins. I'm part of the Just One Thing for Health team. And we just appreciate you so much for supporting us, supporting you. We want to say good night on that note. Thank you once again, Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Feinsinger. And thank you, Peter Goldstein, for really having the idea and the wherewithal to bring all of this to bear. Without you and what you've done to make all of this happen, we wouldn't be here right now helping so many people. So thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.